All right. The book of Nahum. In fact, we're going to be in Nahum, Zephaniah, and Habakkuk today. Um, I, I am going to go quickly. They are uh, uh, seven chapters between the three of them. So uh, I, think we can, I think we can cover them today. Um, I'll walk through them in order. Uh, remember, uh, we spent four weeks in Isaiah, and so you may have lost the focus of, of what we're doing. Not that you lost focus on Isaiah, but you lost focus on the pattern that I'm doing. Uh, I am working through chronologically. Now, there are several books in the Bible that we just can't identify exactly, precisely where they go uh, in order. And so I've done the best I can to put them in the order that I believe and present them to you in that way. And so that's what we've been doing up till now. Isaiah was uh, an 8th century uh, prophet, so he wrote in the 700s. We are now moving into the 7th century, and we're going to look at the 600s, the 7th century writing prophets, the 600s, and these three uh, represent those. Uh, and then we will, uh, we will be headed towards the 6th century. Now, the reason why I'm telling you is I want you to get in your mind. So, 8th century, 722, the northern kingdom falls. So, the Assyrians, whose capital is what? What's the capital of Assyria? Nineveh. Nineveh, that's right. So, Nineveh, capital of Assyria, um, they take over the northern kingdom, move people around a lot, take people ca captive, put them in exile. It's not really true to talk about the northern kingdom, though, Israel, as going into exile, because it really just ceased to exist. It was, it, they did, some were taken into exile, but as a whole, it was just all mixed up, and they just disappeared. Uh, they became the, what we know as the Samaritans um, from Samaria, the northern kingdom, and so that's, that's what they became. And uh, they were really just uh, um, mixed up. They, they weren't purely um, Hebrews anymore or Israelites. So that happened in 722. In 586 is when Babylon finally took the last group of uh, folks from Jerusalem. So Jerusalem falls in 586. But there were three waves of exiles that went out to Babylon starting in the, uh, in the late 7th century, the late 600s, and then all the way to 586, so early 6th century. So we are moving toward that, but we haven't gotten there yet. So this is in the interim time between the fall of the northern kingdom and the fall of the southern kingdom. That's what we're looking at with these three um, these three writing prophets. So everybody good? I know I did that really slowly. Uh, it's because I'm having to pay close attention to what I'm actually saying. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's, it's taken a little bit of effort to, to make sure I communicate well. But are everybody with me? I can, go, I can do it again if I need to. All right, so let's look at this. Um, I, I have done this since you don't have a handout. Uh, the, each of the books have three slides that I'm going to use. I'm just trying to get, I'm, I'm trying to prepare your mind for where we're going. So each one of these has three slides. The first two are introductory slides. The last one is the outline slide. So the first two will come up completely like this. The last one will come up line by line because I'll walk you through the text, okay? So that's what we're doing. So quickly on these, the introductions. Nahum's name means consolation. It means consolation. So not like a consolation prize, but like God is actually consoling his people. Um, Nahum begins, actually, it says this, the oracle of Nineveh or burden burden or oracle of Nineveh. And so we know that uh, the book of Nahum is talking about Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, because it's, it's the very first statement in the, t in the book. Uh, and so, um, and then it says the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elokshite. Now we don't know where Elok is. We don't know where he comes, or Elok 
is. We don't know where he comes from. All we know is what it just says. The Septuagint, y'all know the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, and that it was done about 200 years before Christ. Y'all know that? Y'all have heard of the Septuagint before. Um, Septuagint really means the 70. That's where the name comes from, um, because there were 70 translators. Uh, in fact, what the, the, the legend is, it was 70 translators took 70 years to translate into the Greek. And so that's where this comes from. When they translated that, if you remember a, a long time ago, I told you that the Septuagint, they translated more than just Scripture. They also translated other works of, uh, of literature from the Hebrew into the Greek, and some of those works made their way into the Septuagint altogether. And that's another story for another time, but that's what we're talking about. So the Septuagint translators placed the book of Nahum after Jonah in their order of the books because Jonah talks about Nineveh and Nahum talks about Nineveh. But they're separated by hundreds of years. And, and so um, the, uh, our, um, our canon that we follow, the order of books that we follow, has them separated. Um, there are dates found within where not there aren't dates found within there are date dating indicators found within the book of Nahum uh, the first one is Nahum refers to the fall of Thebes in verse in chapter 3 verses 8 to 10 it says are you better than no Ammon uh, and that no Ammon or no Ammon that word is the old word for Thebes Thebes is a city where yeah, around the Nile in Egypt. Thebes was in Egypt. And so <clears throat> Assyria came from the east and took over um, what we know as Palestine area. Um, so Assyria comes in, takes over the northern kingdom, works their way. But if they're going to hold that area, they've got to, they've got to go up against Egypt because Egypt is the next major empire to the west. And so Thebes fell. So uh, we know that Thebes fell to the Assyrians in 663. And so that's what this is. So we know that at least uh, this he wrote before 663 because he includes it here. I mean, after, sorry, after 663 because he includes it here. Nahum speaks to the fall of Nineveh as its future. So he's prophesying future to the fall of Nineveh, and we know that it fell in 612. So Nahum wrote somewhere between 663 and 612, somewhere in that time is when he wrote this. Um, so he was a 7th century writing prophet. Everybody good with that? I know I messed it up, but I hope I, I, hope I corrected it in time. His purpose for writing was to prophesy of the destruction of Nineveh. Now, I'm going to ask you this question. I'm not going to completely answer it right now, but I want to, I want to prime the pump of your mind to think over the next three books that we're talking about today, Nahum, uh, Habakkuk, Nahum, Zephaniah, and Habakkuk. So here's the question. Why would God's people care about the future destruction of Nineveh? There are two right answers to this question. Why would they care? Do you know? Anybody hazard a guess? Yeah, to free Israel. Not necessarily to free them, but remember it was the Assyrian Empire that that wiped out the northern kingdom. You were going to say the promise of renewal. Promise of renewal. So here's here's the what question would you have even if northern kingdom southern kingdom have been divided if this evil empire called Assyria wiped out the northern 10 tribes of God's people. What question would you ask? 
Well, that's the other one. So, but that is a, I said there were two right answers. That's the second right answer. Are they going to come get us? Are we vulnerable? That's the second one. The first one is why would God allow this to happen? Why would God allow an evil empire to wipe out the northern kingdom? Remember, even in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah in chapter 10 addressed Assyria as God's tool, as God's axe, it says, there in, in Isaiah chapter 10. And so this is, a, this is a legitimate question that people would be asking, are we next and is God fair in allowing them? Now, I'm going, to speak, I'm going to show you where we're headed and how to apply it to today. And I want you to think about this. You don't have to answer this now. But I want you to think. We believe that because America has stood on the side of right for a long time, God's used us, World War I, World War II, Cold War, we think that because we seem more just than other nations, that God would never allow one of those unjust nations to punish us. But as we're going to see today with Nahum and Zephaniah and Habakkuk, especially Habakkuk, you're going to see that God used a very exceedingly wicked nation to judge his people. And so I just I want us to see that we're not just talking about something that happened a long, long, long time ago, but what we're really talking about in all three of these books is the very nature of God, the character of God. What is he allowed to do, and when is he allowed to do it? Now, I know we don't talk about God like that, because obviously God can do whatever he wants, but that's the point. We have we have so shaped our minds to think. Now, we might not ever verbalize it, but we think God can't do that to us. God can't do that. And, uh, and that's a dumb thing to stay, say on its face. God can't do that. So anyway, let's look at this together. We'll keep going. That's the purpose, to prophesy of the destruction of Nineveh. So let me give you a historical background very quickly. Assyria is now at the height of its power. It's not going to get any stronger, but it is now super duper strong. Assyria, Assyria began deporting the Israelites between 745 and 737, so about 100 years prior, Assyria is starting to deport the Israelites, the northern kingdom. In 722, Assyria overthrows Israel. If you remember from the book of Isaiah, Assyria laid siege to Jerusalem under the king Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the Jewish king. Sennacherib was the Assyrian king. But you remember that God defeated Sennacherib and the Assyrians. Um, that's when I told you that they all woke up dead. 186,000 of them woke up dead. That God just destroyed them supernaturally as they encamped around Jerusalem. So that was the Assyrians that were defeated by God. Assyria captures Thebes and northern Egypt under, that's another king, not Sennacherib, but Ashurbanipal, easy for me to say. It was he that Nahum prophesied against. So I want you to get in your mind. You've got the Assyrians who laid waste to the northern kingdoms. They're at the height of their power. The southern kingdom are worried about two things. Are we going to be taken over, and why would God allow them to be this great nation? And, and so they're on the top. And that's when Nahum speaks. So back in your Bible, Nahum chapter 1, I'm going to read the first eight verses. The oracle of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elokshite, a jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries. He reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In whirlwind and storm is his way, and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers 
Bashan and Carmel wither. The blossoms of Lebanon wither. Mountains quake because of him, and the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by his presence, the world and all the inhabitants in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken up by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who take refuge in him. But with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of its sight and will pursue his enemies in the darkness. Wow. Okay, so there's God. Now, by the way, I want to show you something really quickly. This is the orthodox take on who God is. You can hear that. You remember when Moses said, Lord, show me your glory? Y'all remember that? And so um, he, had him, he hid him there in the cleft of the rock, and then he passed before him, caused his glory to pass in front of him. And Moses saw him. Do you remember what the Lord said about himself when he arrived? The Lord, the Lord, righteous in anger, but slow to anger. He will no, by no means uh, excuse his, uh, unrighteousness or, or, or unfaithfulness. This is exactly that. In fact, you see it pop up in the prophets throughout Scripture. This is, so if you were to say, what's the best way to describe God? You ought to go back to Exodus chapter 32 and 33 and use God's own words to describe him. Because this is the take all through the Old Testament. This is it. And you hear it right here. Slow to anger, great in power, will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Uh, and, and so it walks through this. Uh, and, then it's, and then it says, but the Lord is good. So um, when I was a little kid, I was taught to pray like this. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. By his hands we all are fed. Thank you, Lord, for daily bread. Amen. All right, so that's how I was taught as a little kid. My parents didn't teach me that. My parents are so Baptist, they do not like any rote prayer. All right, so they, my parents, they, they didn't teach me that. But I learned it in Sunday school and probably at VBS and other places, hanging out with other kids. I learned it. Well, this is saying that very thing. God is great. God is good. That's what this is. God is great. This is the, he, he is a jealous and avenging God, avenging and wrathful, takes vengeance on his adversaries. Um, what word do you think we ought to hear in verse number two? Which is the one that he repeats? Avenging, yeah. Yeah, just listen. The Lord, uh, uh, jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. He takes vengeance on his adversaries. If you read verse 2 and don't get the fact that God's going to take vengeance on those who are wicked, you missed and you don't know how to read. All right? Because that's what he says over and over and over again in one verse. Well, who is he going to take vengeance on? The unrighteous, but in this case specifically, who? Assyria, the Ninevites, that's what this is about. I mean, right up from the front, you see that God is going to take vengeance. Now, here's my question. Does God have any wrath and vengeance left to give today, in our day today? <laughs> yes, yes. In fact, the only place that you can hide from God's wrath is in the Lord Jesus. All right, that's the great promise of Jesus. In Jesus, and this, and, and I don't, I don't just mean this in a literary way. I mean in a, in a spatial way. In Jesus, in that's a, a play, That's where we are. If you belong to Jesus, you're in Him. So in Jesus, Jesus has absorbed or received all of the wrath due your sin. That's what the cross is. That's what it means. Jesus absorbed or received. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not our sins only, but the sins of the entire world. That word propitiation means God or Jesus taking care of God's wrath. 
uh, yeah, he stood in our place, assuaging God's wrath, um, absorbing God's wrath. But, but for those who aren't in Christ, God's wrath remains, and, and, he, and he's going to pour it out with indignation. So um, there's two sections here in the book of Nahum. The first is that God decrees Nineveh's destruction, and it's so it's those are first uh, the first chapter, uh, verses one to eight, is a tribute to God's power and character. It's what I just read to you. Verses nine and following is is not his character, but is a testimony to God's overthrow of Nineveh. So God says, I am going to overthrow Nineveh. Whatever you devise against the Lord, he will make a complete end of it. Distress will not rise up twice. Like tangled thorns and like those who are drunken with their drink, they are consumed as stubble completely withered. For you have gone forth, one who plotted evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Thus says the Lord, though they are at full strength, and likewise many, he's talking about Assyria now, though they are at full strength, and likewise many, even so they will be cut off and pass away. Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no longer. So now I will break his yoke bar from upon you, and I will tear off your shackles. The Lord has issued a command concerning you. Your name will no longer be perpetuated. I will cut off idol and image from the house of your gods. I will prepare your grave, for you are contemptible. <laughs> you see what's God? So there are, there's two things are happening. The Lord is speaking through Nahum to his own people. But he's speaking to his own people about the, the Ninevites, and he's saying to the Ninevites, I'm going to destroy you. Then he turns back there in, in, verse, uh, in verse 13, 12 and 13, he says to his own people, look, I'm going to break the shackles. Isaiah said Assyria was the tool that was going to discipline God's people. Now God says that time is no longer. They're no longer going to be that disciplinary rod I'm going to break, I'm going to break Assyria. Then he turns back to Assyria and says, I'm going to wipe you out. You're not going to have gods. You're not going to have temples. There's not going to be anything left of you. You're going to be, I'm going to take care of you. That's the theme of, of Nahum. You are going to be gone. The second section, chapters two and three, is Nahum describing Nineveh's destruction. So go down to verse three of chapter two. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap this up very quickly. There's not a lot. I mean, you've you've really experienced Nahum. Unless I read all of it to you, this is this is all it's about. So just listen. The shields of his mighty men are colored red. The warriors are dressed in scarlet. The chariots are enveloped in flashing steel. When he is prepared to march and the cypress spears are brandished, the chariots race madly in the streets. They rush wildly in the squares. Their appearance is like torches. They dash to and fro like lightning flashes. He remembers his nobles. They stumble in their march. They hurry to her wall and the mantlet is set up. The gates of the rivers are opened and the palace is dissolved. It is fixed. She is stripped. She is carried away. Her handmaids are moaning like the sound of doves beating on their breasts. Though Nineveh was like a pool of water throughout her days, now they are fleeing. Stop, stop, but no one turns back. Plunder the silver, plunder the gold. There is no limit to the pleasure, I mean to the treasure. Wealth from every kind of desirable object. She is emptied, yes, she is desolate and waste. Hearts are melting and knees knocking. Also anguish is in the whole body and all the faces have grown pale. Nineveh is going to get wiped out. Lock, stock, and barrel. Army is going to get crushed. The streets that were secure are now raceways for the enemy's chariots. All the silver and gold and everything that they stockpiled, it's going to be plundered. It's going to be gone. Assyria is no longer Nineveh is overthrown. And it goes on like that. That's a, that is the prophecy of Nahum. So any questions about Nahum? Assyria? Oh, yeah, this, was, this is hundreds of years after Jonah. The, yeah, this is hundreds of years after the revival. That's a good thing you brought it up. Remember, there was a revival in Nineveh. 
And so God stayed his hand for a century and a half almost. But then it was time. Uh, which leads me to tell you, there are two things that revival does not cross. There are two things that revive, and this is just true. I mean, it's true, and it's true in today's world. Two things that revival doesn't cross. It doesn't cross cultural boundaries. And so a revival, um, because, because of the language barrier, because of those kinds of things, a uh, revival that, take, that maybe sweeps a nation won't, won't sweep another nation. So the revivals that are going on in Iran, the revivals that are going on in China, they're not going to spread beyond their cultural boundaries. Um, it, that's just the way it works. Um, I'm not putting a limitation on the Holy Spirit. I'm just saying that there would have to be a fresh movement in another cult culture for that culture to experience revival. Do you all understand what I mean? I'm, uh, Billy Graham's revivals did not shape the whole world, although he had his, he had his um, meetings in those worlds. It was up to the, uh, the way that Billy Graham worked is he, he energized the local churches around, and, uh, and it was up to those churches to, f to fan the flames of that revival. But I would not say that there was a worldwide revival in the wake of Billy Graham, even though he preached to millions, um, and he preached in a lot of places, um, it's possible that what we see today going on in China and in Iran and other places may be the, the fruit of the seeds that Billy Graham planted, but there was no worldwide revival that happened. It just didn't, it didn't cross that. that that's, a miss, that's a missiological truism. It just doesn't, it just doesn't do that. It doesn't, it doesn't jump over um, uh, cultural boundaries. It's why when we send missionaries around the world, they have to, they have to learn the language. It's not just so they can communicate, it's so they can communicate the truth in their language. They can minister in that language, and language is part of culture. So that's the first truism. I need to hurry. The second truism is no revival can span generations. Every generation has to have a new revival. And that's what we see in Nineveh. Even though Nineveh was, was shaken free, there needs to be another. You know when the, the last major movement of God in America was? Does anybody know? It was in the 70s. Um, what we know as the Jesus people movement. The Jesus people movement that, that uh, among the hippies, when God started to, to win hippies to Jesus, and, and the, the hippie movement out west, it spawned Calvary Chapel. Y'all know, y'all have heard of Calvary Chapel and all the movement. And so that was, the, and, and it wasn't just out west. That's where it was mainly. But in, in the, there are people in Memphis who tell the story of, of seeing hippies come to Christ in those churches and, and transformed and, and all of that. Uh, so the Jesus people was the last major movement of God in America. My generation has not known a major movement of God. My kids' generation has not known a major movement of God. There hasn't been one for 50 years in America. There's never been a major revival, a major awakening on the west of the Mississippi in America. All of the awakenings that took place in America took place east of the Mississippi. And so... <laughs> That's where we are. That's, that's the nation that we have. Um, it's easy for us to live in kind of denial um, in the Bible Belt, but I want you to know that the Bible Belt is no longer the Bible Belt. I mean, it's not uh, the Bible Belt that we remember of the 50s and the 60s and the 70s is gone. It's, it's, it's not... There are still remnants, still vestiges of it, but it's gone. And so the reason why I tell you all that is Nineveh, you're like, Robin brought up Jonah. Yes, there was a great awakening, a great revival in Nineveh. But 100 years later, there was no remnant of it, and God destroyed them. And so we have to win every generation to the Lord. You can't just expect them to grow up in church and know it. And that's what we did over the last 50 years. We expected them to grow up in church and know it and they're gone. They're gone. 
And so that's our, that's our task. That's why Vacation Bible School is so important. That's why ABC Preschool is so important. That's why, and not just that, but our reaching our neighbors is so important. Um, we could say that the reason why uh, Concord is the, the percentage unchurched that it is is because all the Yankees moved down from New York and Pennsylvania, but that's not true. We've been losing Southerners for 50 years. We've been losing not just Southerners, but our own family for 50 years. That's where we are. And so that's, these are just missiological truisms. All right, enough of the bad stuff. Let's keep going. All right, so the attackers come to destroy Nineveh. That's what I just read to you. And then the Lord tells us why he's judging the city. It's because they're wicked. They're wicked. Um, starting in verse 8 of chapter 3 and going on to the end, um, he mentions lots of things. Uh, you're drunk. You're fornicators. Um, you're terrible people. You're turned away from us. Um, you, don't, you don't honor me. And so I'm going to kill you. And he destroys them all. Zephaniah, the next in order of, um, um, the next in order of chrono chronology, but probably, well, not probably, you have to skip Habakkuk to get there in your Bible. And we'll go back to Habakkuk in just a second. Zephaniah means Yahweh hides. Yahweh hides. Now, it, I, I don't know. I, I can't figure out a link between his name and, sorry about that. It's popped a couple times. Um, but I can't determine a, a link. And when I say I can't, neither can the scholars. Or else I just read one of them and I'd figure it out. So uh, I can't find a link between his name and his message. Sometimes their names go right along with it. Um, but I can't find it in this case um, because this is really a revelation, not a hiding. Um, it's, a, it's an opening, not a sealing, if that were, because Zephaniah is talking about the day of the Lord, the day of Yahweh. Um, it's possible, perhaps even probable, that Zephaniah is the grandson of King Hezekiah. Now, if you have a, uh, a newer translation of Scripture, like mine, New American Standard, um, it will say, the word of the Lord came to Zephaniah, son of Cushai, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah. So, great-great-grandson of Hezekiah. Mine says it plainly. But the original language doesn't say Hezekiah. It's a, it's a different name but a derivation of Hezekiah. It's a, um, it's a different spelling of what could be Hezekiah. The reason why I think it is Hezekiah the king is because no other prophet is their genealogy traced back four generations. At best, all the other prophets just go the, the, the son of so-and-so. Most of them, some of them don't even have a genealogy at all. It just, like, if you remember Nahum, we don't know who Nahum's daddy was. He just preached and was gone. So to have four generations of a prophet means that that fourth generation is probably important, which would have been King Hezekiah, which at this time would have been the last good king in, in uh, Judah or in Jerusalem until Josiah, which is when he was ministering. Who is, you all know Josiah? He was the young boy who under his watch discovered the law of the Lord. It was read and there was a great, there was a great revival that took place there. So this all takes place about the same time. All right. I hope that draws your mind into where it is. Oh, I wrote it up there. So you can write it down. So during the reign of Josiah, we, we're not, we don't know whether it's early in Josiah or late in Josiah's reign. You say, what does it matter? Well, because at some point in Josiah's reign, they discovered the law and it was later on. So this is probably earlier on because it talks about a remnant of Baal, the false god Baal. 
the remnant of Baal. And so, if you'll remember, after Josiah discovered the law, he tore down all the high places of Baal worship, got rid of it all. And so, this is probably early on in Josiah's reign, although we don't know. There's no way to date it exactly. So, Zephaniah does not mention Josiah's reforms, so it's hard to know precision whether early or late in his rule. Because he doesn't mention the reforms, I suspect it's early on. That's, that's my suspicion, but we don't know. Does that make sense? What I'm trying to do is not just explain to you. I want you to understand the concept of how Bible scholars go about bringing about the dates of when these guys. So Zephaniah tells us it's in Josiah's reign, but Z Josiah reigned for a long time, 31 years. And so when did this take place? And, and so this, this, this is what people think about. This is what theologians do. They wrestle with this kind of stuff, and they look at the text and find out, are there any clues in the text that may show us? And in this case, we don't have any. We don't, we don't have any clues. The purpose, though, is to interpret the day of the Lord. Now, we've talked about the day of the Lord before. In fact, Micah wrote about the day of the Lord. Um, Isaiah mentioned it briefly, the day of the Lord. And so here we are again, speaking of the day of the Lord, and it's all written in Zephaniah. So let me just read a few passages of Zephaniah, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll go to the next page, or the next slide. The word of the Lord, which came to Zephaniah, son of Cushai, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. I will completely remove all things from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will remove man and beast. I will remove the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea and the ruins among, along with the wicked, and I will cut off man from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. So I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and the names of the idolatrous priests along with the priests. And those who bow down on the housetops to the host of heaven, and those who bow down and swear to the Lord, and yet swear by Milcom, and those who have turned back from the following the Lord, and those who have not sought the Lord or inquired of him. All right, so there's a bunch of people there that are disobeying the Lord, and there are a lot, and, and, and so he names them. So when I preach, and I'm preaching a sermon, I'm mainly preaching, I think, to church people. That's, that's most of the time who's in the building, church people. And so, when I preach, I don't call names. I just speak generally and let the Holy Spirit take that general discussion and apply it to those people's lives, who they are. Um, you probably won't have a long tenure as a pastor in a church if you continually call out all the deacons' names in your sermons. I'm just saying, that's, that's probably the way it goes. Zephaniah was not worried about keeping his pulpit. Zephaniah named names. And so that's what he was doing. He was, he was really, and I, that's a joke, but, but he really was pointing his finger at all the different offenders that were in Judah at the time, in, Jer in Jerusalem at that time. And so let's talk a little bit about the spiritual condition of um, Zephaniah, or the historical background of Zephaniah. Assyria was losing its power now. It's on the, it's on the, on the downswing, and Babylon is ascending. Babylon's coming up, Assyria is going down. Josiah, the king, followed two wicked kings, Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, and Ammon, the son of Manasseh. Manasseh led, is, or led Judah and Jerusalem back into idol worship. Manasseh was a terrible king until he himself was taken into captivity in the last five years of his reign in which he repented and turned away. But the damage was done, uh, not for Manasseh. Manasseh received forgiveness in his own life, but his pattern his legacy was cemented as one of idolatry in Israel. So just Josiah follows that. 
because of Manasseh and Ammon following after Manasseh in idolatry, idolatry was rampant during their reigns. Baal and Molech and Ashtoreth and Chemosh and Milcom were all rivals of Yahweh God, the one true God. So lots of things happened. Some of the people in Jerusalem just completely turned away from the one true God and began to worship these other gods. Others tried to worship the one true God along with the other gods. And I'll just let you know that neither of those are better than the other. If you worship, if you worship the one true God, your only choice is to worship the one true God. You can't tr worship the one true God and someone else. Um, just because I've talked a little bit about our, our culture today, I think this is probably the, the biggest sin that's going on in the so-called Christian church today is we want to worship Jesus and the God of this age, and it's not going to happen. You can't do that. You can only worship Jesus, or if you, have, you worship other things, you bring other things up to his level, he's, he, you lose him. You lose your worship of him. So that was their worship, and you, can, you heard what I said. Um, uh, I will cut off the remnant of Baal, and the names of the idolatrous priests, verse 5, those who bow down on the housetops to the host of heaven. So Ashtoreth is the queen of heaven, <coughs> so-called queen of heaven. And, and those who bow down and swear to the Lord and yet swear by Milcom. You see that? Those were their beliefs and their worship tendencies. But notice when your worship goes astray, so does your activities. If you worship, the, in fact, there's, there's a whole theology called you are what you worship or you become what you worship. And so if you worship the one true God, your life will begin to bear the marks of worshiping the one true God. In fact, liberty, freedom, um, righteousness, care for neighbor, love for one another, all those are the products of worshiping the one true God. child sacrifice, worship of the sun and moon, injustice, male and female temple prostitution, all that marked the culture when they turned away from the one true God and worshiped these other things. By the way, those should all sound like really familiar. Child sacrifice, worship of all kinds of other stuff, injustice, male and female temple prostitution, that's the, that's the character of our age today. It's because we've chased after other gods. I don't mean we like us in this room. I mean we as a culture have chased after other gods. And by the way, they're in churches where they're tolerating other gods. Um, yeah, anyway, I, I digress. I, I heard a, well, I, I can't, I don't have time. Let's go on. Let me just show you all this. I'll do it like that. <clears throat> so, the book of Zephaniah is broken down into two parts as well. Uh, chapters 1, verse number 2, through chapter 3 and verse 7, talks about the judgment of the day of the Lord. Now, you ought to remember, when you look at the book of Zephaniah, what I've told you from the very beginning, that when we see God's judgment, it's accompanied always by His salvation, mercy, salvation. Judgment, salvation always go together. The book of Zephaniah is no different. You notice the first part is the judgment of the day of the Lord. The second part is the blessings of the day of the Lord. So it comes in together. When Jesus returns, I'm going to go forward to that time. When Jesus comes back, and I'm talking about he's riding on the horse, all his people are behind him. He comes in, I'm talking Revelation 19. When he rides in, is that a good day or a bad day? <laughs> That's exactly right. It depends on who you are. It depends on who you are. That's what I want you to think when you think of the day of the Lord. That's why Zephaniah is divided as it is. It depends on who you are. 
That's the truth. By the way, the gospel depends on who you are. Paul said it this way. The proclamation of the gospel is life to those who believe, but it's cursing to those who are already perishing. That's, uh, unless you, Jesus said this, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. This is the truth of the gospel, of the promise of the coming of the Lord, of the day of the Lord. Now, remember, when, they're, when these prophets are looking from their vantage point and looking forward to the day of the Lord, I believe they are seeing all kinds of phased, P-H-A-S-E-D, phased increments of God's, what God is doing. I don't, I don't think the day of the Lord is one day. I think the day of the Lord is what the Lord does over time through ultimately the Lord Jesus. So when we read Zephaniah, we see some immediate things, some things that were going to happen within 100 or 200 years of him. Then we see some things that happened when Jesus came. And then we also see some things that aren't going to happen until Jesus comes again. All right, so because he's looking, remember I told you like a looking at a mountain in the, in the Rocky Mountains. You're standing there in the flat plains east of Denver, and you're looking to the west and see those mountain ranges there, and they all look like it's just one wall of mountains. But when you get there closer, you see that, well, there is a ridge of mountains right there, but there are other mountains that are still behind it. And you, and you cross those first mountains to the ones that are behind it, and you see that there are some that are still further behind it. But from, from the vantage point of Denver, and you're looking out there, it looks like it's all one mountain range. That's what, that's what the day of the Lord looks like to these prophets. Does that help you understand? All right, so if, um, uh, Linda said before this, have we done Daniel yet? And I said, no, Daniel, we're still going to do. And she says, lots of it is hard to understand. Well, that's because when Daniel is writing, Daniel is looking at that mountain range and trying to describe it all. Same with Zephaniah. He's looking at the mountain range and trying to describe it all in one, in one discussion. And so what we have are things that are phased throughout history, some right then, some later than then. So uh, let, me, let me show you what those three, those three ga- t- days are, and then we're going to go on. The first event that Zephaniah sees is the exile and return. So Babylon comes in takes Judah out because of their idolatry, but then they'll return back. The second one is when Jesus comes the first time, born of a virgin, introduces his kingdom. He says, um, it reads Isaiah 61, I have been, the Holy Spirit has anointed me, um, to proclaim the, the uh, day of the Lord, right? The, the year of the Lord. This is, this is what he's doing. So the, the ministry of Christ, which includes what we're doing right now. We are still in that ministry of Christ, except this, the Holy Spirit, it's, it's mediated through the Holy Spirit through us, right? Y'all, know, y'all see that. Like this is the extension of what Jesus has done. That's why the Great Commission matters, all that. It's the extension of, or the expansion of Jesus's ministry. So, exile and return, we could call it the church age, Jesus and the church age, and then the return of Jesus as he establishes his kingdom here on the earth, or we might say the millennium. Okay, everybody see that? So, there are things in the book of Zephaniah as we read it that touch on each one of those. And if you read it straight through and you're like, man, he's all over the place. Well, he's not all over the place. He's just looking from a distance, and he sees everything out in front of him. Does that, does that help you understand? Okay, so that's what's going on. By the way, I like this, verse number seven. Be silent before the Lord God. I think some of us need to learn that, me included. Be silent before the Lord God. That's a good, a good thing to remember. For the day of the Lord is near. For the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guests. Notice who's doing the work there. The Lord. That's right, the Lord. 
The Lord is doing the work. He prepared the sacrifice. He consecrated his guests. By the way, if we are consecrated before the Lord, it's because he did it for us. Jesus did it for us. Then it will come about on the day of the Lord's sacrifice. I will punish the princes, the king's sons, and all who clothe themselves with foreign garments. And I will punish on that day all who leap on the temple threshold, who fill the house of their Lord with violence and deceit. On that day, declares the Lord, there will be the sound of a cry from the fish gate, a wail from the second quarter, and a loud crash from the hills. This is all around Jerusalem. Wail, O inhabitants of the mortar. That's a neighborhood there. For all the people of Canaan will be silenced. All who weigh out silver will be cut off. It will come about at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men who are stagnant in spirit, who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good or evil. What does it mean to be stagnant? Not doing anything. Just kind of there. What a description of our age. Just stagnant. Stagnant. Stagnant is also not just, um, so we talk sometimes, I won't tell you which child, we talk sometimes about one of our child as moving like pond water <laughs> because she is so slow. Again, I'm not telling you which one it is. <laughs> yeah, I won't call names, but my daughter is slow. And I mean, she is sweet as pie, sweet as all get out. But she was always the last one to the car when it was time to go to church. Just slow. So when we think of stagnant, not, not we now, not Myra and me, but when we think of stagnant, you just, it's, it's that idea of pond water. But it also means spoiled water. You see, stagnant's not good. You wouldn't go drink stagnant water unless you put iodine in it to purify it. You wouldn't, unless it's treated, you wouldn't do that. And so that's also connotated in this word stagnant water, that it's spoiled, it's not good anymore. And, it, and notice what characterizes them. They're saying the Lord will not do good or evil. What they're saying is the Lord's not going to act. He's not going to move. And friends, that's how most people, Christians or not, are living their lives today. Like there's not really, like the Lord doesn't really do anything. Like, yeah, they're blind or they're asleep. If they, if they don't belong to the Lord, they're blind. If they do belong to the Lord, they're asleep. That's why in Romans it says, awake, O sleeper. Go, go ahead. Okay. Oh, okay. It, it's, um, that's why in, in Romans it says, awake, O sleeper. We're, because lots of times it's easy for us just to, to fall into a trance. So, um, that's the judgment. He, he declares this judgment in two ways. Judgment on Judah and Jerusalem. That's what I was just reading to you. And then in chapter 2, the judgment on the surrounding nations. And he goes through specific nations. But those specific nations are, uh, I believe, characteristic or emblematic of all the nations. All the nations. So he, uh, verse 4, Gaza, Ekron, these are the, these are the uh, Philistine city-states. Um, Canaan, land of the Philistines, verse 5, uh, Seacoast, verse 6, Ashkelon, verse 7, uh, Moab, verse 8, Ammon, uh, 8 as well, Moab and Sodom, uh, Ma Moab like Sodom, Ammon like Gomorrah, um, all through there. So you just see Ethiopians, verse 12, Assyria, verse 13, uh, and just on down through. And so it's not just Judah and Jerusalem, it's all of them. But then we get to the blessings of the day of the Lord, starting in verse 8. Therefore, wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up as a witness. Indeed, my decision is to gather the nations, assemble the kingdoms, pour out on them my indignation, all my burning anger, for all the earth will be devoured by the, the fire of my zeal. For then I will give to the people's purified lips that all of them may call on the name of the Lord, to serve him shoulder to shoulder from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. My worshipers, my dispersed ones, will bring my offerings. And you just see this great blessing to all the nations. So judgment, salvation. Notice who does it. God judges, God saves. This is the Lord doing his work. It's a great, great promise. Any questions on Zephaniah? 
All right, very good. Y'all are listening quickly today. I'm thankful for that. One last. Habakkuk. Yes, Habakkuk is strong medicine. Habakkuk, Habakkuk, Habakkuk is, uh, is exceedingly quotable. Yeah, do it again, Lord. There are lots of good, good things to quote in the book of Habakkuk. So let me just tell you from the very beginning, if I don't quote your favorite verse from Habakkuk, it's because I'm not going to read them all. <laughs> I have about 10 minutes and I want to get through this. Habakkuk's name means embrace, like a hug, embrace. Um, possible that he was a Levite musician. He uses a musical term here, so it's possible that he was a Levite who served in the temple, who was a musician as well. Although he might not have been, he may have just been a normal person. All we really know about Habakkuk is the oracle which Habakkuk the prophet saw. That's it. Habakkuk the prophet, that's all we know about him. Um, dates, 609 to 597. So within the days that Babylon is now starting to take um, uh, Jews into captivity. All right. Jerusalem hasn't fallen yet, but Jews are already taken into captivity. He is a contemporary of Jeremiah the prophet. Can anybody guess what we're starting to look at next week? Jeremiah the prophet. Oh my goodness, I love Jeremiah. But uh, so he was, he hung out with Jeremiah. These guys, I don't know if they knew each other, but they were probably did. Jerusalem wasn't that big of a city. They probably knew one another. And they, they both might have been within the, the, the court of the temple and the, uh, uh, and the palace. So they may have known each other. Well, that says it's a contemporary of Jeremiah. It doesn't mean about the same time. About the same time. That's right. Um, so when we talk about furniture or home furnishings being contemporary style, what we really mean is to, today's stuff. When you say contemporary music, I know to you it means a certain style of music, but it really means just today's music. Contemporary just means now. And so contemporary of Jeremiah means they are in the same time, that they're together. Con, together, temporary time, together time. That's the word. So they, they were together about the same time. The Chaldeans are rising to power. When you hear Chaldeans, think Babylon. I just use the word Chaldeans because that's the Bible word for them. Nebuchadnezzar was a Chaldean. And so I just, I use that. The Chaldeans are rising to power, so Nineveh has probably already fallen. Um, remember, with Zephaniah, Assyria's on the downswing, Babylon's on the upswing. Now it's probably Assyria has fallen, and, uh, and Babylon is, is strong. The corruption in Judah does not point towards Josiah's reign, which means this is probably after Josiah in Jehoiakim's time. Remember I told you that, that uh, um, revivals don't span the next generation. This is probably the next generation after Josiah's revival. And so idolatry's back. All of that's back. It's why we have to reach the next generation all the time. All the next generation is always our mission field. And we have to teach that generation to reach the next generation. That, it just has to keep going. Everybody good? All right. So the structure of Habakkuk, it's written as a dialogue between the prophet and God. That's how it's written. And it's broken into two parts. I'll show, it. I'll show you how it breaks down in just a second. But this is, this is the structure. The first, how could God allow Judah's wickedness to go unpunished? Lord, how can you let us continue like this? God answers. Does anybody know how God answers? Don't worry, prophet. I'm going to send the Chaldeans to take care of it. So, Habakkuk has a second question. Why would you let the wicked Chaldeans be, uh, be, the, be the way that you punish a less wicked nation? 
Why would you let a more wicked nation punish a less wicked nation? And this is really what I wanted you to see about some of the attitudes that we have about America and, and other places. We think, well, God won't let them do that to us because they're more wicked than we are. That was Habakkuk's question when God promised him that the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, were going to be used as judgment on God's people. I'm not, I, by the way, I'm not a prophet, right? So not in that way. So I'm not saying that we have some impending doom, although it sure looks like it, but I'm not speaking of that from a, from a biblical perspective. I'm just trying to show you parallels and how sometimes we have faulty thinking in the way that we think about our own age, that, that we, we can fall into a trap where we think that because we're, there are Christians in America, because maybe when we were founded, there were a lot of Christians in America, that somehow God owes us a favor. And, and I just, he may, I mean, he, he doesn't owe us a favor. He may give us a favor. His grace may continue to overflow us, and I hope it does. But I don't want us to get caught in the trap of expecting it. Because I think, I think that's the problem in all the Old Testament and the New Testament is that God's people get lazy. They get stagnant. And, and I, if I have a task, if, if God, if I could sum up my calling in one task, it's to keep us from being lazy. Uh, like I don't, um, I say the things that I say not as a prophet, not saying this is surely going to come to pass, but to say, hey, look, People have made this mistake before. Let's not make this mistake again. So that, I think that's my call. I, lots of people have different callings. Uh, there are some pastors, preachers who are super evangelists. Like that's, their, that's what they do. And you can see it in the fruit of their, uh, of their uh, uh, altar calls. People just stream forward. I mean, God's just got a, that's their blessing. That's what they do. For whatever reason, that's not mine. What God has called me to do is to warn God's people about getting lazy, about thinking bad thoughts, about falling into routines that are, that are destructive in us. Um, and I think it's because that's, that's my own, that's what I say to myself, right? So that's, it starts here. That's my, I don't want to get lazy. I don't want to, I don't want to not know. Hosea, Hosea chapter four says, my people my people are perishing or being destroyed for lack of knowledge. Well, like, I don't want to be that guy, right? And I don't want my people to be that people. So that, that's, that drives me probably more than anything else. That's why I say what I say. That's why I say some hard things sometimes is because I'm just like, hey, wake up. We need to stay alert. Reach your kids, reach your family, stay alert. Let's, let's keep together. Let's stay together. For those of you who went to Israel with me, you know, that was like my thing. Hey, stay together, keep together. We got to, you know, count you in, count you out. It's because God is like, I'm responsible, not just in Israel, but like I'm responsible. I want us to stay together and keep moving towards the Lord. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. So like, that's, that's my driving thing. And so that what we see is that God can use ungodly nations to judge his people. So Habakkuk's first question, you see it there. Look at verse 2. How long, O Lord, will I call for help, and you will not hear? I cry out to you violence, yet you do not save. Why do you make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yet, dis yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. Therefore, the law is ignored and justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, justice comes out per perverted. Why does that happen, Lord? Why do you keep letting me see all this stuff, but you don't take care of it? And the Lord says, don't worry. I'm raising up the Chaldeans to judge these folks. Verse number five, look among the nations, observe, be astonished, wonder, because I am doing something in your days. You would not believe it, 
if you were told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that fierce and impetuous people who march throughout the earth to seize dwelling places which are not theirs. They are dreaded and feared. Their justice and authority originate with themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards and keener than wolves in the evening. Their horsemen come galloping. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swooping down to devour. All of them come for violence. Their horde of faces moves forwards. They collect captives like sand. They mock kings, and rulers are a laughing matter to them. They laugh at every fortress and heap up rubble to capture it. They will, then they will sweep through like the wind and pass on. But they will be held guilty, they whose strength is, not, is their God. And so um, this is what God says. Uh, and so um, here is Habakkuk's response. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We will not die. You, O Lord, have appointed them to judge, and you, our rock, have established them to correct. Your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. Why do you look with favor on those who deal treacherously? So his second question is this. Why use the Chaldeans? Why do you choose them? And God says, don't worry. I'm going to destroy them too. See, the similarity between Nahum and Zephaniah and Habakkuk is this. God will judge his people, but he's also going to judge those that he uses to judge God's people. In fact, let me put it in a different way. We all stand before the Lord. And our only hope is the Lord. That's right. Our only hope is the Lord Jesus. Our only hope is Him. God is no respecter of persons, whether it's the Jews in Jerusalem or the Ninevites in Assyria or the Chaldeans in Babylon. God is no respecter of persons. God will judge. And here's, here's the truth of everything. God's going to judge all the nations. There's not going to be any nation that escapes the judgment of God. Not then, not now. The only hope is to belong to God's kingdom, to belong to Jesus, to belong to this thing that God's doing that's outside political kingdoms or whatever. Um, By the way, that's another thing from Daniel that we get, this idea that that uh, kingdoms come, kingdoms go, empires rise and fall. Only the kingdom of God is going to persist, endure forever. So what are your questions? Three minor prophets. Yes, ma'am. Okay, you were talking about uh, revivals mm-hmm. back in the earlier generation. Mm-hmm. But a bunch of these uh, prophets lasted more than one generation, right? Um, they lasted, so they, they may have spanned generational kings, but what, what I mean is a revival itself won't automatically be picked up by the children. So, no, we don't have any evidence of revivals spanning from one generation to another. The next generation has to choose to trust Christ. It doesn't, or, or in, this, in their case, follow the Lord. It doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't follow that way. Now, obviously, just like in this room, you can look around this room, there are multiple generations in this room. And so if God were to grace us with a revival, uh, there would be multiple generations that are touched. What I mean really is that the generation that's alive at the time of that generation, even though they span different age differences, it, it won't automatically affect, it won't pass into the next generation. It won't, it won't, when that generation is gone, all the people that are alive when that revival came, when they're all dead, it won't automatically span to the next generation. It's like the work ethic of the people from World War II desert. Population. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, it has to be intentional is really what I mean. It's not going to happen by accident. It's, it's why you've heard me say to parents that they are the primary disciplers of their kids. Uh, they have to, they have to do it or else they'll, they'll raise up another. Let me read one more thing. I know what time it is, but let me go back to, go back to the book of Joshua. Go back to like the first chapter of the book of Joshua. I want to read something to you just really quick. Cause it, it, not Joshua, judges, sorry. 
first chapter of the book of Judges. Oh, well, you know, I won't be able to find it. Chapter 2, turn over to chapter 2, verse 10. All that generation also were gathered to their fathers. This is all the ones that were with Joshua that took over the, the land. All that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. That's what I mean. So even after God delivers all of the all of the promised land to Joshua and all their people, there arose another generation right behind that one. When that one was all gone, that didn't know the Lord nor his works. That quick. I mean, they had just moved in to the promised land, and that quick they were gone. So you have to intentionally... Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's really good. God has children, not grandchildren. The um, uh, that's tr that's true. I don't. You can't say it any better. We we have to, and we have to reach our grandchildren for the Lord, so that when we're gone, they'll still continue to walk after Him. That's the real. That's the real goal. And by the way, I've seen some of your grandkids this this week. I, I've hunted for one. <laughs> we, went, we went looking for the wanderer together. Uh, Spencer, uh, Claudette's grandson, likes to uh, uh, explore and freak everybody else out while he's exploring. He's not worried, but we are. <laughs> uh, and so we went... What's that? Yeah, get him chipped, or at least let him wear one of those bracelets with a with a, a iPhone, iPhone tracker on it, so you can keep up with him. Uh, that may be a good idea. Y'all may can get one of those things. Let him wear it as a necklace. And oh, okay. Well, yeah, well, it may be true. So, anyway, all right. Any other questions? I know I took, I kept you five extra minutes, but I did go over three books. So, forgive me for for taking you five more minutes. That's right. Today is my mother-in-law Sue's birthday. So she's happy birthday. Yeah, that's right. So uh, um, I can't sing it to her today. We're, the Behringers are celebrating tomorrow night, and so I'll sing it tomorrow night to her. So. <laughs> happy birthday, Sue. And so uh, anybody else? Birthdays close by? Sue Lily, when was yours? Oh, the 26th. Okay. Good. Oh, wow. Good. Very cool. And uh, Don Russ turns 80 sometime next week, too. So oh, on Monday? On Monday the 18th. Okay, good. All right. Says there are Sunday school teachers who keep up with that kind of thing. Very good. I'm so proud of you. Um, and I don't, that's not tongue in cheek. I'm very, I love it when Sunday school teachers know about their people. That's a good, that's a good thing. All right. God bless you. Have a great day. Thanks for being here. Thanks for putting up with my raspy voice. Uh, we are meeting next week. We are starting the book of Jeremiah next week. I'm going to be in hog heaven, and uh, so I hope you'll invite your friends because it's going to be a good time. Uh, most of my revival services, like if, uh, if a church invites me to come preach a revival, most of my revival sermons come from the book of Jeremiah. So we may be in Jeremiah for a year. No, we won't be. But uh, we could be because I love it. So God bless you. Have a great evening.